I've seen things that before they took away Twitter from me, I've seen things that show 80% of the country does not trust the government. I mean, that's a huge number, 80%. Probably the 20% that do work for the government. So, I mean, it's just a matter of time, right? So in, now, you know, sadly, the, the, they don't trust the government, but they don't know what, the, they don't understand that this is the solution yet. You know, and that, that, that's sad. I mean, it's still a small percentage that get that this is the solution. And, and we really are very, very early here. Um, I mean, I, I was an investor in the internet. I mean, this still, I still feel like we're in 1995 or I mean, 1997, you know, 95 is when, the, when we went from green screen, you know, um, lines of code to, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a browser. Um, you know, the first Netscape browser came out, but you know, it really didn't get going down kind of around 2000 or so that, that the whole thing caught on. So it, it's just, it's early. We're just, it's very early here in this whole thing. And anybody, I mean, people are going to be like, you know, you own a whole coin. What the hell are you talking about? How can you possibly own a whole coin? Well, I do. Today, we're diving into the mind of Lawrence Leppard, an investor with a keen eye on the intersection of government trust, cryptocurrency adoption, and the evolutionary journey of Bitcoin. Before we unravel the insights from Lawrence, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the bell so you never miss out on our expert analyses and predictions. Lawrence points out a staggering statistic. 80% of people do not trust the government, which speaks volumes about the current state of global financial systems. But here's where it gets interesting. Despite this lack of trust, the majority are still in the dark about cryptocurrency being a viable solution. I mean, the way, the way I think about people, I was, I was at this uh, conference and I, I sat down with some guy. He was mining him on his Apple II when he was you know, much younger. And he said, yeah, I, you know, and, I, and then I bought a bunch too. And he says, I think my average cost was about $2 a coin. And I'm just sitting there thinking, holy shit. You know, I am, I am so jealous. <laughs> It's so crazy to just kind of look back right. and think about a time where, you know, 2016, 2017, it's like, yeah, uh, under a thousand dollar Bitcoin. And you think about it now, you're like, oh, my God, I wish. Yeah, I wish. Right? Well, and, you know? and, and by the way, Nico, I mean, when, when it's when it's a million dollars a coin and somebody says, you mean to tell me you were buying corn at twenty thousand dollars? Well, how is that possible? I mean, our grandkids will certainly say that, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just no doubt in my mind. So. Um, you know, but what's the path? Who knows? I mean, that's that's the hard part to, you know, but it doesn't really matter. You know, it really doesn't matter. And and as I say to all my potential investors and people who are looking at it, I just say, you, you just can't. I mean, I and I with my friends, I just employ them. It's like you can't have zero. This thing is so goddamn asymmetric that, you know, even if you just put five grand, I mean, figure a number you can afford to lose and put it in there. Right. And and, um, you know, I think you'll wake up in 20 years and be really glad you did. What's your take, Larry, on the 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 diminishing returns narrative? Look at Malcolm Gladwell. What is it when you get to ten percent penetration or something? You, you rapidly go to ninety percent, and I don't know where we are worldwide, but but in terms of assets and dollars, I don't think we're even close to ten percent. And so you know, as as a as a, as a sense of that, um, no, I I completely reject the diminishing returns. One thing that was a little interesting though, I think the last peak, the double peak in the sixties. I think that was a little lower than it should have been. Um, and I think that might have been because of the Chinese mining. And, I mean, there might have been a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, one thing is it's a wild animal. You never really know what it's going to do. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, is, where does this peak? I mean, I, one thing, the other thing I, I do think will happen, too, is I think as we get more institutional adoption, the adoption gets more widespread. I don't think we're going to see any more 90 percent drawdowns. I don't think we're going to see any more 80 percent drawdowns. I doubt we're going to see a 70 percent drawdown. We could probably see a 60% drawdown. I mean, I could easily see this thing running to call it 400K, you know, um, on this on this round, on this halving, and then pulling back to what's, you know, I don't know, down 60% from that. Was that 240 or something? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, who knows? But it's hard to say. Um, I guess that's not a full 60% drawdown. 60% would be different. But, uh, you know, it'd be 160. But the, the point is that, you know, it's it's getting more adopted. And so I no diminishing. I don't accept that. Uh, I accept that, you know, it's I'm with Sailor. We're going higher for, forever, Laura, and it's going to be a lot higher. And the ranges are just going to keep changing to the upside. But having said that, you know, anybody who does enter it has to has to come in fully aware of the volatility. I and mean, I was very disappointed when in the 60s, you know, when a lot of people just, oh, you know, mortgage the house, go crazy, buy 100 percent. 
and, and they didn't take the time to look at the prior 10 years or 13 years at the time, whatever it was, and realize that, no, hang on a second. You got to be ready to, you know, okay, fine. I mean, I was average. I was buying at 69. No problem. I was buying, I was dollar cost averaging, but, but I also knew that it could go down, you know, and, uh, and it did. And you know, I, I view that as, as great, you know, at 15, 18, 20. Yeah. I love that. You know, I mean, I, I bought, um, I bought a lot in, um, in thanks, uh, Thanksgiving of 2017. I don't know if anyone was around then, but, uh, you know, I pumped, it, it went from a thousand to 17, you know, relatively short period of time. And I bought a lot at a thousand too, but you know, at 17, I was buying like crazy because I, I was going to a hundred and, uh, uh, of course I was wrong. Um, and, um, you know, it went to 10 and I thought, all right, well, I still believe. And I got some more money and I doubled down. And then it went from 10 as, you know, very briefly, it touched like three, eight or four. I, I think I paid four or five for it. And I doubled down again. And so, you know, my view is, you know, there are only 21 million of these things and, um, you know, 8 billion people and 45 million millionaires. And, um, you know, it's, um, I think that owning a lot of this stuff makes a shitload of sense. And, uh, you know, I, we'll see. As we delve deeper into Lawrence's experience and observations, it's evident that the journey of cryptocurrency particularly Bitcoin, is nothing short of phenomenal. Hearing about individuals mining Bitcoin on an Apple II or purchasing it at $2 a coin makes us realize the incredible growth and opportunity that has been presented over the years. Lawrence's perspective on Bitcoin's future value, potentially reaching $1 million per coin, not only fuels the imagination, but also underscores the importance of participation, no matter how small. This brings us to an essential question. How do we approach investing in such a volatile yet promising market? The concept of diminishing returns versus the potential for exponential growth due to factors like absolute scarcity, ETFs, and halving events opens a rich dialogue about the future of Bitcoin and its adoption curve. Let's unpack these ideas further and discuss how current trends and in institutional adoption may shape the trajectory of cryptocurrency investments. I think everybody just should, right off the bat, if they've got none, they should take 10% of their investable assets and buy um, and, and buy Bitcoin. Um, beyond that, uh, I think you have to determine what your risk tolerance is, what your cash needs might be in the future, how long your time frame is, liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. But then, of course, I recommend just DCAing. Um, I've just to answer the question I get asked a lot because I'm still a gold guy and believe in gold is that um, what's your balance, gold and Bitcoin? And I'm half and half. I'm half gold and gold related things, mostly gold mining stocks. And then I'm half Bitcoin. Uh, and this is for my investable assets, you know, and it has to, it really has to do with just um, the tolerance. Well, it has to do one with my legacy business. And I can't tell all my investors I've abandoned the thing that they bought into. And then two, um, you know, I, I like, I like having an asset that's less volatile um, and yet has a, has protective capabilities versus, you know, the monetary printer. So, and that's, that's why gold is of value. Do you believe this cycle is going to be different? Yeah, I do. I actually think I think we're going to run harder and further as a result of um, both the having and um, and the um, well, the other cycle was driven by the having. But I think the ETFs changed the game. And I also think I also think we are at that tipping point where, you know, everyone pretty much everyone in the country has now heard about Bitcoin. OK, I mean, it's not like I mean, whereas in the last couple of cycles in 17, nobody heard about it. And in the one, before, you know, the one after that the last one, a lot of people had heard about it. Nobody had bought it. I don't know where we are in terms of penetration, number of people who own some of it. I still think it's probably lower than 10%. I think we're getting close maybe to 10% in, in the Western countries. And um, we cross that 10%. That's the tipping point book by Malcolm Gladwell that says any new adoption, once it crosses 10%, it really starts to accelerate in terms of adaptation. And you can see that in cell phones, cars, airplanes, all of them. And so we're kind of at the point where I think the curve is going to get really steep. And um, so, you know, it's going to be it's going to be different. It's going to be a it's going to be a nice, nice run. And, you know, I've seen projections for this run from everything. I mean, I think the low end of this run is 150. I'd be shocked if we stopped there, but we could. Um, I think the high end is Samson's million dollars. I think the more um, likely, you know, I, I kind of guessing this cycle is kind of 300 to 500. I, I'm guessing some of the old longtime holders, maybe even including myself, would part with a few coins at 500,000 coin. You know, I, uh, there's some fiat things I'd like to have that I might sell a coin or two for. But, uh, you know, but I, I mean, 100, man, I'm not selling it 100. Screw that shit. I mean, that's, 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 you know, that's jacks for openers. I mean, we're, we're going well past 100. So in my 100%. Yeah. In my view. Yeah. 100%. The party's just getting yeah, started. Yeah. We're just, this is, this, 
this, this party is just getting started. Lawrence suggests allocating 10% of investable assets into Bitcoin and employing a dollar cost averaging strategy. This advice is particularly poignant in a landscape where risk tolerance and market volatility are at the forefront of every investor's mind. But beyond just strategies and allocations, Lawrence's dual investment in gold and Bitcoin reflects a broader narrative about hedging against monetary inflation and diversifying one's portfolio in uncertain times. As we reflect on Lawrence's projections and the potential for a significant market run, it's crucial to remember the importance of informed decision-making and understanding the inherent risks and rewards of cryptocurrency investment. Whether we're on the brink of a tipping point in adoption or yet another cycle of highs and lows, one thing is clear. The journey of cryptocurrency is one of innovation, resilience, and, potentially, unparalleled growth. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto as we navigated through Lawrence Leopard's insights and the fascinating world of cryptocurrency. If you found this analysis helpful, please like, subscribe, and share this video with fellow crypto enthusiasts. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep investing wisely.